I, I, I will do it. Thank you very much. So let's give him a hand to walk in. So people can hear me. This is. Got it. Very good. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, it's exciting to come and visit with you about some ideas, and I'll give you a little of my background to sort of fill in on what we're talking about here. My, my career started in geological engineering, and then someone asked me what job I thought I should have when I came out, and I actually told them geophysics, because I was also going to graduate in that at one time. So I ended up as a geophysicist, uh, and did my early career with Placer Dome, ended up as chief geophysicist. And then went to junior sector in the mining companies, and did entrepreneurial things. And, and then more recently, I've got a recruiting company. So the last 12 years, I've recruited talent for the mining business. So I've really turned over to the dark side in that sense. And, and you can imagine what happens when a geophysicist ends up in HR space. First, I was lost. I had built my own team, so I'd done those things before. But the main issue for that is I didn't have the tools that typically HR people would have. The tools I had were engineering and geophysics tools. So. Uh, God forbid I digitized the HR space. And so I went through and looked at resumes, looked at the skills were necessary, built matrices, uh, mapped careers, all of those things. And so I basically translated that in to a data set that I could look at to decide how to go forward. And that turned out to be very useful because in the end, the people that buy the human resource services for the most part in the resource industries are engineers and scientists. So I actually ended up translating HR stuff into that space that my customers needed, which was the engineers and the scientists. And then, as my wife points out, I'm never going to retire. I'm just going to get paid less and less. So, so I end up, how are you? I, I end up then volunteering more and more time. So, and I think maybe all of us end up at those points in our career. So I do a lot of volunteer work now with, with universities. I do lecturing at universities. I'm on the advisory board for a number of mineral schools. So I go through and try to find common threads for what makes things work within the schools. And I collect ideas from my candidates for my search business. And then more recently, I, I served on a committee for uh, National Academy of Sciences on workforce for the US for energy, alternative energy, and critical minerals. And for me, that was a shocking addition. And you're going to see these pieces in here. Because previously, when I saw a problem, my first thought was, how can I exploit that in an entrepreneurial sort of way? And of course, when you're asked to look at this at a more national level, you're not supposed to do it that way. So you end up trying to think of the bigger picture. And then having done that, I was most, more recently asked to work with the National Academy of Engineering to look at the future of mining. On a, on a position paper. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about you here is related to that paper that I just submitted recently. Short little paper, kind of an opinion paper to, I was telling Dick Berg, to incite people is what it amounts to, because it's, it, it has controversies in it. So let me start with a quote. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. So what I want to talk about here is a whole set of facts that relate to challenges in the mining industry, resource industries going forward. And I want to then look at that in the context of critical thinking, because there's a story around those facts. The stories can vary a lot. But then how you assemble that is how you draw a conclusion. So I've got kind of a fun little exercise. Here's the Holy Bible. This is Gideon, so I borrowed it. So I'm going to talk about critical thinking and Genesis. So now, right now in your mind, a bunch of you know me, a bunch of you don't. Most of you don't. So where do you think I'm headed with this? Kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> so, so the idea in here is that you're trying to find a reference point in the back of your mind of how that is relevant. Because I just told you I'm going to do this. 
And there's some of you that know me very well. Well, my brother-in-law, Ralph, knows me very well. So he's going, oh, my God. <laughs> What's Lee going to do? And Leo I've known since we started freshman year up here. So they have some idea where I'm going to head. A bunch of the others don't know me at all. So you only know that I'm a geologist and probably what are those monkey trial things that were in uh, Kansas. So there's a lot of nervous stuff that could potentially be there. And that's what's running through your head right now in trying to structure those random thoughts. So my story, and Bev has actually heard me tell the story. It's kind of a fun one. So a mother is in the kitchen, and she's peeling potatoes. And her son is sitting, five-year-old son, is sitting at the kitchen table. And the son is, has the Bible. And the son opens the Bible and goes, Mama, 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 and pulls out leaves. So the mama says, what did you find? And he says, I found Adam's underwear. Now the point that I want to raise there is that is critical thinking. This five-year-old, it is a completely random set of things. The Bible is in there somewhere, stories he's heard in there somewhere. For those Canadians, that's a Canadian maple leaf. So he has actually referred to those on very random sort of thoughts and assembled a very unique idea. Now the challenge then for critical thinking is that's what you want to do. I'm going to tell you a story with a whole bunch of data. Hopefully I'm going to be more correct in my critical thinking than Adam's underwear. But nonetheless, that's the challenge as to how you assemble these pieces of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story. There's five slides here in, in a sequence. I've got them modified a few times. There's actually 12 in total that'll be the story. And then I'm going to go through some details on the big, big picture, population resource model, unique role for Montana, unique role for Montana Tech. And what I'm looking at then is the challenge between technical resource delivery, which is what the technical engineering schools do, and the social interface for the challenges going forward. And I'm going to start with Butte, obviously a Butte picture there. And Butte nominally in its heyday, when the copper that was developed here basically wired the US Industrial Revolution. And then eventually was added other copper mines. But that conversion from the copper in Houghton and Hancock, Michigan, in the Kewanee, to Butte wired the US. And it was the heyday of Montana Tech and the relevancy. And I'm going to take that to the other extreme. So I'm going to talk about sustainable population in the world. This is a UN number. As you know, increasing affluence, birth rates drop off. So those numbers, by the time they're all balanced together, the US number is 10.5 billion people in the year 2100. In the first sense, 2100 sounds a long time into the future, but it's only three generations. And many of the things involved here are generational value changes. Now, the other thing that you see in that particular set of data is 40% of the population today is in three countries. China, India, and in the future, Nigeria. So in that, and those are basically unchangeable dynamics. So I'm going to convert that then to a resource model. This is a Rio Tinto database. My wife is the research librarian for Rio Tinto Minerals, so this isn't secret data. It's actually available on the web. You just have to know where to look for it. It's specifically a uh, Rio Tinto chart book. And it's just full of amazing data. So what this has at the bottom is per capita income of the world average. So right now, 2010, it's 10,000 people or $10,000 in one generation. It's $26,000 per person. For reference, the US is here. The other dimension in here is mineral consumption that is the Rio Tinto portfolio of minerals to saturation point. So at what point in time in your per capita income 
are you stable and no longer increasing your consumption? Now what's relevant in here is going from here to here, you build societies, which is iron, steel, and copper. That's a given. Specific numbers would be, that's about four kilos per person in copper there, and it's about 10 kilos per person copper at saturation point. So now we've got a model for the challenges that we have in the resource industries. There's China, per capita income in 2008, per capita income in 2025. So we're looking at a model that has the population by 2100 increasing by 3 billion people, but the affluence going up four or four, five times. So what does that mean then in the context of natural resource development? Changes consumption, but it also changes beliefs and values. Because increasing affluence changes beliefs and values. So I want to expand on that. This is the system broken. So what I'm showing here, this is Macquarie Bank data. Inflation adjusted iron since 1900. And what you're seeing in this data, you actually build societies with this. The US was built here. And what you're seeing there is 103 years of continuously decreasing price of iron. We're doing our job great. And then you see the system of supply demand collapse. And you see a step change in the price of iron. We're going to talk about that. This is copper. 1960 here. But you can go back further. I just didn't get that data. So again, carry it through ever decreasing value into 2003. System breaks. So what happened? So now I'm going to just do a little block diagram to sort of think about it and put some semantics to it. This is an ugly, ugly graph or slide, but it, I, I need to talk to something here. So basically, it's supply in here and demand in here. God made the geology, so we're not changing that. And then after that, we've got technology to work on that geology. We have, and I'm going to use the phrase here, development support and operating support that are societal. And then we have production systems. Then we have demand to serve society. Now, the reason I'm talking about development support and operating support, the idea of development support would be Mining Law of 1872. Very simple land tenure system. You create the value, easy to acquire the land, you can go forward. So the US wanted to support that system. This would be depletion allowance. And education system, so the schools then, land grant system, would educate the engineers necessary for this to work. Now with that basis, let's talk about responsibilities. This is not changing. Industry is responsible for technology and production systems. And society dictates demand and the systems we're allowed to use. So now we've got sort of a vocabulary that we can look at and start analyzing problems. So just a simple little visual. Society gets greener, demand increases, and support disappears or diminishes. What happens? Now, obviously, what happens is you see that collapse in the price. So I'm suggesting, critical thinking sort of thing, this is a vocabulary then to look at needs and problems and justify challenges going forward. So I've established a vocabulary. And the biggest challenge in here is who addresses the whole picture because it's a global problem. And there's no global organization. They have the UN, and that's not going to work in this problem. And particularly, when the society that's making the rules on development is affluent, 
and has $40,000 a year income, and the people that are affecting the price of iron can no longer access it. Who speaks for them? That's a serious problem. And it's not equitable. So Pete, you'll know who this is. Floyd, you'll know who this is. So we have a history of Montana Tech of some spectacular leadership. Anybody recognize that? Who, who recognizes that picture? So his family immigrated with the Russian Revolution in 1920 to California. He was a white Russian. Graduated from high school there and then went for his undergraduate degree in minerals at UC Berkeley. Graduated in 1931. Now where, if you're going to do minerals in 1931, do you go to graduate school? Montana Tech. So it's Plato Melazimov. So Plato Melazimov then went in as a young engineer, 1945, joined Newmont. So how many people know where the word Newmont came from? New York, Montana. It was founded by people from Montana living in New York. So Plato at one time was the longest standing CEO for a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. A phenomenal leader. And he came to Montana Tech because Montana Tech was relevant for the rewiring of the US and the Industrial Revolution. So we have a history of leadership when we're relevant. So let me talk about sort of a step-by-step, -step, big, big picture, and then step through the rest of this. Just some simple thoughts. This iron graph, simple supply and demand. What does it mean when you know the production or consumption is going up and the price is going down? Oversupplied market. Mining industry is doing a great job oversupplying the market, and in terms of those assets that were found here and produced here, actually destroying value for the mining companies. Because they're paying this amount of money to find it, this amount of money to build it, and they repay it here. So the question then becomes, do we need research in mining? Find evidence for it. We're oversupplying the market which is probably why we have very little research in the mining industry. Now, what happens here? Now we've got a problem. Now there's a new paradigm. So what I want to do is look at that, and it's the perfect storm. So what happens here, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. How many people familiar with the book Silent Spring? Of course, the premise there, and it was voted by Discovery Magazine for scientific literature, number 16 of the 25 most important science books written. And the concept there was that in the quest for quality of life and all of the mechanical things we do, there's actually some actions that we do destroys quality of life because her story had to do, I think Floyd, this had to do with accumulation of DDT in, in birds' eggs and things like that. So the concept of silent spring, which is a very visual, is that if we keep doing this, we won't have birds. So she tells this story. And we start then in affluent countries redefining quality of life and what constitute costs. Because to the degree that a bird song has value, I think we'd all agree they do, it's not included in the regular costs. The other part is the Chinese economy takes off. Now, I just showed you then the Indian economy and then the Nigerian economy. So now, innovation needed. What innovation? So let's now then talk about a population and a resource model, and I'll fill in some details around that. 
This is out of the CIA country data book. Again, I'll use 1960, and it's GDP changing. So we hear how big the Chinese economy is. It is small compared to the US economy, a $15 trillion economy. Here are the other large economies. Very, very small. Look at the rate of change of China. So I just threw two parallel lines across there to show you same rate of growth, growth rate as US. This rate of growth with 1.3 billion people broke the system. Not really surprising, actually. This is a real ugly diagram. Um, I break all kinds of rules. It drives my wife crazy because she sees me with a glass of wine, writing a talk, cruising around on the internet, grabbing graphs from anywhere, and throwing them into talks. This is actually out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So, Bev, you probably know the author. You know this guy? It's an amazing piece of work. And the question was, I, I like to use, there's a five-syllable word up there, Neil Malthusian. I never got a chance to put one of the word with five syllables in, the, in a title before. But it really means the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And so you do a test, and that's what he did. He's an analyst in the department connected to the White House. So same as the one that you were in, and Murray Hitzman was in that same one. So he's looking at per, uh, life expectancy is that yellow one. Population is this one. And he's looking at things that could negatively affect it, greenhouse gas, blah, blah, blah. And what he finds, no evidence the sky is falling, the sky is falling. That's not what I want out of there. He's got this graph, affluence. So what I wanted to do then is drag that particular one out. And what you see is linear increase in affluence and right there, a new world. Something else is happening. A, a fundamental increase in the affluence in the US starting in early 60s. There's Rachel Carson's book. I'm certainly not saying that she created the increase in affluence. But what I am saying is that when you tell a really important story that has value and it rings a chord that is relevant, things can happen. So what happened is increasing beliefs and values because of increasing affluence and the value of a bird song is now relevant. This was the galvanizing moment. It wasn't even probably very special until this point when walking in the forest started to have more value. So fundamental changing in beliefs and values start occurring in an affluent country. That's a very simple sort of dynamic. This is Dick where I can get controversial. So if people start throwing stuff at me, you've got to. <laughs> So leadership or followership? As a drum major in front of a band. Rules and regulations, beliefs and values. Was Rachel Carson a leader? Or did she galvanize something that was already happening? Courtney, I told you I'd get Obama into this. You could ask me to. So who has more influence on society's beliefs and values? Because that's what we're talking about in setting the right criteria and the rules for mineral development in the US and the world. I kind of like the Dr. Phil picture. So I tried him out, he didn't look very good. I vote for Oprah. Because when she says something, you can actually see the New York bookseller list go nuts and stuff. So strong evidence that she can influence that. So what's Obama do? So I want to talk about how you get elected. 
because here's society, and it's getting greener, and it's changing those rules. And let me suggest, we don't care who's in charge, just tell us the rules. Because our job is to take the geology and meet the demand. And all that stuff is what it is. No whining, no complaining, get the job done. Now we have to figure out if Obama's going to go away or not. Trust me, he's not going to go away. So you've probably seen versions of this map. This is the red-blue map, of course. Presidential election, the last one, by county. Obviously, it's electoral, so the county isn't how it counts. This is a frightening map. Obviously, a sea of red and a little bit of blue, and blue wins. So an interesting little point is Obama carried virtually every city in the U.S. with a population of greater than 100,000 people, with the exception of Salt Lake City. So what does that tell you? So did Obama make the map, or did the map make Obama? I'd say the map made Obama. And behind Obama, the cities get bigger and people get more affluent in the US and then internationally. Cities make people liberal. That's not going to change. And they consume more. So get over it. And you know, a little sign on leadership that says, let the bastards freeze in the dark, not leadership. We have to somehow make that thing work. So here's the world version. So I'm always frightening about the stuff I can cruise around <laughs> the glass of wine at night and find that was out there. So this is a, a set of um, social scientists that have their own organization, and they map the world value system and have been doing this since 1983. So they have it by country, by generation change. They've watched it change over time. So across the x-axis is survival values versus self-expression values, traditional values versus secular relational values. Not my vocabulary. But I am a geophysicist, and I know that signal. That's real stuff. Social scientists know what that stuff is. Here's the US. And beside the US is Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, and Ireland. Pretty good peer group. Pretty good signal. Down in the corner, Zimbabwe, Morocco, Jordan, Algeria, Uganda, and Bangladesh. Pretty good signal. And up in the corner, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Finland, Switzerland, Iceland, Scandinavian countries. Pretty good signal. Now, what do we know is going to be happening? We're going to add 3 billion people to the population, but the affluence is going to go up four or five fold. So you tell me what's going to happen. And they're going to consume more metals. And I can tell you how many metals for real, Ken, and I can calculate it. That's a serious challenge in terms of innovation. Montana. So I mentioned, it's kind of a fun one, Tamarack Mine in Kiwanee, the Leonard Mine in 1914. I think some of the same people are in those pictures. Looked, can't quite tell. Because as you know, when those mines needed to expand, there were labor problems and they were not scalable. So a lot of those people from Upper Peninsula, Michigan, came to Butte and started those mines. So that is our heritage and it's where we got started and it's how we built the nation with the copper side. Most people have seen this picture, haven't you? It's sometimes called Manifest Destiny. So if you go to the ultimate source of all information, Wikipedia, and look up uh, 
Manifest Destiny, you see this picture. That's where I took it from. I want to talk about that picture. It was actually done in 1872. And what you're seeing in here is the displacing of wildlife and native population with the advancing frontier of mining and settlers, followed by infrastructure, transcontinental railroad, the telegraph system to support cities in the east. So a very, very simple story. Make it even simpler. All that stuff was promulgated under Lincoln between 1860 and 1863 during the Civil War. So the Morrell Act, of course, is the land grant college. Homestead Act, of course, you're familiar with. Chaffee Law was the foundation for the mining law of 1872. Passed the act that did Transcontinental Railroad that linked, and he created the National Academy of Sciences to make sure that rules were made with proper science. So he set the foundation for the US and Manifest Destiny in the early 1860s. And then we lived that luxury since then. And what did we learn? Silent Spring, don't displace that wildlife. They're part of quality of life. Native peoples, oh my god. What a mess. So we learn those things in the context of Manifest Destiny in 1860, and we go back and change the rules appropriately, because now we know. We do it in the US, but now we've got China, India, Nigeria, and the rest of the world with a very functional model, very understandable. We wouldn't replay that the way we did before, but we did. Now we've learned that lesson. One of the largest human migrations in history was the California Gold Rush, obviously 1849. So they came two ways to California, one around the Horn, and they all kind of arrived there in 1849, 1850, you know, fill in the blanks. And most of them didn't find what they were looking for. So they ricocheted back. So they are the gold rushes that were Virginia City, Bannock, Pikes Peak, um, Park City, Boise Basin. And all of those occurred 1862 to 1872. And why gold? Didn't need infrastructure, high unit value, low level of technology. Most of them were placers. Simple enough to do. Infrastructure had come across, and now it filled in. So now you can do copper. So many of us might remember the rantings of K. Ross Tool over at the University of Montana. He hated the Anaconda Company. It was a history, wasn't he? Did he call it history? Sure. Hated him. Because he said what Anaconda did and what people did in New York, California, was nothing short of economic colonization. Destroying cultures, destroying land for the economic benefit of others. Maybe not purposely, but in reality. We learned that lesson, that's the reality. We have almost no people to make our case. So if that was economic colonization, isn't this recreational colonization now? Got whitefish up there, Yellowstone Club, Telluride, Santa Fe, Sedona, Park, um, Sun Valley. Why don't you just shut the state down because I might want to visit there next summer. And you must just love it here, getting to float down the Big Hole River all the time. It's the only job you got, though. So who speaks to that dichotomy? Because that's not abusive, but it's a reality. Gold for Montana Tech. That's the dynamic for Montana. And innovation is needed. Montana Tech stepped to the challenge 
in the context of providing mineral resources for the U.S. All those mineral schools, by the way, in the U.S. were basically all created between about, I think maybe 1885 and 1910. Does that sound right, Pete? Literally every one of them. And there were lots of them. And then as mining became less relevant, they started to disappear. They're all created for that particular period of time. Montana has a history of oversight for natural resource developments. In fact, the very first state environmental act, and that was just within a year of the federal one, what? Preceded. Preceded it. So then hard rock mining impact, there's a whole list in here, but hard rock mining impact was mining operations and the effects on communities. Kohler Stout was the chairman of that first committee, and actually I was the first one to put a permit to it. Kohler was shocked. I actually got it turned in on time and didn't have a terrible amount of misspelled words. So, And then the good neighbor agreement you're probably familiar with, and that's the still water development with surrounding counties. Surrounding counties weren't going to let them do it, so they went individually to the counties and worked out a program of communities working with the mines so you could have both the natural resource development and a proper relationship with the communities. Now this is embarrassing. Per capita income in the US or in, in Montana is in the bottom quartile. And on this side of the diagram, I've got per capita income across the bottom. Those are the mining and petroleum jobs. Plus 70,000. No surprise, you know that. Recreation, arts, and hospitality, 15,000. Lower than the average in China. That's terrible. Federal government? <laughs> Employees are here, states here, locals here. So can Montana actually have both a reasonable natural resource development and reasonable incomes? Got some of the earliest laws. If we can't do it in Montana, where are we going to do it? Because this is just the beginning of the problem. So somebody's got to figure this out. We have a rich history of being able to balance this stuff. So who's going to provide a leadership role on that balance of quality of life that relates to elk hunting and fishing and a reasonable job as well? Or is a significant part of the population going to be left with waiting for people to show up so you can run them through the Bob Marshall or float them down the big hole and try to find something in between, usually out of state? because this is just starting globally. So this is a US issue, but somehow we have to be able to look at that at a global basis because China's not going away, India's not going away, Nigeria's not going away, and the consumption of those people we can calculate. Now, I don't know who's calculating it other than Rio Tinto and BHP saying, oh boy, <laughs> I got these mines built and if they don't build any more mines, that price is just going to go nuts. And it did. Because this is just simply a fact. And if you don't keep people on that curve in China, that's revolution. Because those people see a standard of living, and they see an opportunity, and they're going to get it. And we had ours. Why don't they get theirs? Again, this is out of the Rio Tinto data book. This is all the iron in the world. So it's the cost profile for all the iron in the world. $50, $100 a ton, $150 a ton. The 50% point is right about here, about $100. All of that iron has got to be increased to that much iron in the next eight years. That is short. The average time to develop a new large mine in the, U in the world, if you can do it, is 20 years, SEG number. So when you fall behind, it's really, really hard to catch up. So what happened in Australia, $82 billion in capital investments last year, almost entirely in the iron industry. They have serious iron deposits. Now they tell you the price is coming off. 
give me a break. It was $35 before it took a step change over 100, and now it's fallen back off. I mean, that's ridiculous. What did they think was going to happen? Is it going to continue going? Because the real issue is that step change on the consumption. Now, they got more costs because they built additional capacity. But somehow, in just the next eight years, that iron has to come. And then 2025 is when China's done on that scrambling forward, and India's right behind it. So there's four large copper mines currently in the development sequence or just having come in production. There's Tenge in the Congo that Freeport has. There's uh, Oya Tolgai in Mongolia that Rio Tinto put in production, Ivanhoe. Actually, that was a, a Montana Tech graduate that drilled, was president of Ivanhoe, by the way, and was involved in those discovery holes, and Kuntz. Probably a bunch of you know him. Um, and resolution in Arizona. Arizona was acquired by Plato Melazima's company, Magma. And then, and then BHP acquired them. Then the major discovery was made. And all of those mines have serious problems today. The Pebble Mine, the major financing partner, was Anglo. After $550 million, they walked away. And I don't think that thing can be permitted. So if you want to see a lot of data about the mine, open a Trout Unlimited site. And I'm not saying it should be developed. I'm just saying if you choose not to develop it, there's consequences. Oyo Tolgoy, what is it, 35% of the GDP in Mongolia, and that's a functioning democracy. That's tough. They have a lot of problems. Resolution. Rio Tinto just laid off almost the entire staff because they can't complete a land trade necessary for a little park that sits on the top because they need permission from the Apache Nation. May go forward, may not go forward. All of that copper needs to be done somewhere, and none of it is going to be easy. So where do we need innovation today? Say broadly, where do we need research today? There's all these technical issues that are all still very valid. And there's the technical issues that help mitigate the challenges that are environmental. But the big challenge is the societal constraints and people believing and trusting that we have functional systems to go forward. And that story can't very easily be told by the large mining companies. We have vested interests. It needs to be done by organizations that have credibility, third party objectivity, to be able to address those topics. So civil society starts to see that you can't have this without having that. And not everyone's going to buy that story. So the price of metals are going to have to go up. But some people might buy it. And somebody's got to start into that process. And I guess my point here is, if not in Montana, and there's not the range, I think, of social scientists at Montana Tech, but Missoula and Bozeman have a bunch, to be able to frame this problem and try to figure out how to solve it at a bigger scale. And it just represents an opportunity. That needs to get done by somebody. Because what we looked at in Butte originally are grandfather's imperatives in the context of economic imperatives, social imperatives, and environmental imperatives. Our grandfather's version of that business was economics dominated because stuff was important. And with Rachel Carson's book and increasing affluence in the US, we strike a balance. And civil society doesn't believe we even have the balance or the science to be able to go forward with that. So last best place sort of ad sort of dates me, because I don't think Montana uses that phrase anymore, but I always liked it. So there's a balance of 
hunting and fishing and mining in the context of today's social balances and environmental balances and economic balances that is proper in Montana to try to get those people that are making $15,000 a year balanced off with those jobs that are making $75,000 a year and still be able to have the quality of life represented by last best place. So when your thoughts turn to underwear, remember critical thinking. Probably good advice in general. So comments, thoughts, discussions. Courtney, you probably didn't expect me to use Obama that way, but <laughs> you knew he was going to get in there somewhere. <laughs> The society problem? You know, there was 